Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce myself first. My name is Michael Woody. I am the CEO of Transtex, a textile finishing company based in Cranston, Rhode Island, and chair of the Rhode Island Textile Innovation Network, which is an association of textile companies based in the Rhode Island area. I want to thank our partners today uh, in this endeavor, Polaris MEP and the University of Rhode Island. I also want to thank uh, Senators Whitehouse and Reed who have been strong supporters of our efforts here at Wrighton and who have consistently supported not only Rhode Island textile manufacturers, but manufacturing in general. A little piece of housekeeping. If you have any questions today, simply uh, click on the chat button at the bottom and type it in there. And uh, my intrepid producer, Aaron Reed from Polaris MEP, will monitor the chat room and occasionally we'll stop and we'll see if, if any of you folks have any questions and we'll, we'll get them, we'll have, have these, these expert panelists answer those questions. Um, now in the 1960s, 95% of the apparel that we bought in this country was made here. Uh, now it's 3%. So will apparel manufacturing in the U.S. ever be more than simply a niche or a cottage industry? Can it be profitably ramped up? What role will sustainability play? And what is the proper role for government? And ultimately, will the U.S. consumer buy it? So these are some of the issues that we plan on touching upon today. We have a great group of panelists. Uh, we have the authors of the book, Crafted with Pride, uh, Willie De DeContis and Alex Goulet. Uh, uh, Willie is, um, is a Rhode Island-based designer and he focuses on product and print. Uh, he's currently working on something called Gifograph technology, which is an all-in-one animation machine. Uh, Alex Goulet, his co-writer, is a sportswear historian and research consultant. And he's worked with well-known brands like Champion, Hanes, and others. An interesting piece about Alex and, and, uh, and Willie, an interesting piece of background is they both actually spent a lot of time in the vintage clothing business. And I'll, I'm sure they'll touch on that when we chat with them a little later. Also on the panel is uh, Claudia Middendorf. And Claudia is the founder of Matilde, which is a manufacturer of contemporary soft wash linen quilts based here in Rhode Island. And, and um, Claudia actually grew up in, in uh, the San Francisco area, but moved to Rhode Island to go to RISD and remained here to start her company. Her textiles have been featured in Martha Stewart Living, New England Home, Quilt Folk, and Town and Country. And finally, we have uh, my friend, Dr. Carl Aspeland, who is department chair and associate professor at URI's Department of Textiles, Fashion, and Merchandising Design. Uh, he's also been on the 100-year Starship research team which is a fascinating initiative. He's in, he, that, that team investigates the needs and constraints of textiles for long duration space life, leading to a focus on circular economies and textiles on earth. So it's one of, those, one of those situations where what happens in space affects what's eventually commercialized here on earth. So we're gonna start our questions today with Alex and Willie. So uh, Alex and Willie, and I'll let you decide who's gonna answer which question. Can you please tell us about your backgrounds, a little, little more information on your backgrounds, particularly uh, how the, your, your interest in vintage apparel led you to compile uh, this book, this great book, Crafted with Pride, uh, 2003. Yeah, no, thanks for having us today. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, yeah, I think it's a great place to start, uh, kind of our backstory and how we uh, kind of developed this project. Willie and I met maybe six or seven years ago uh, in a big vintage warehouse in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, I was working on a project. He was working in the warehouse and we bonded over, uh, you know, the gear we were wearing at the time. You know, it was one of those, oh, where'd you get that sweatshirt? Uh, you know, and then that goes into a long conversation. And next thing you know, you got you know, tons of things in common and you're spending hours talking. So, um, so vintage clothing kind of informed us in the beginning. We're coming from a position of, uh, you know, thinking back to, as Michael, you said in the intro, the 1960s times when companies were making everything in the U.S. I mean, uh, a vast majority of the goods that were being worn were made in the U.S. And, uh, you know, Willie and I, 
kind of looked at each other and would say, does anyone make this this stuff anymore? Looking at these old garments, the, the quality, the construction, the graphics. I mean, they were such high quality uh, pieces of apparel. And, you know, we just, we wanted to explore that a little bit more. And, um, you know, through our love of vintage, we, we kind of started uncovering all these great companies that are still around some historical, uh, you know, companies that have been around since the 1800s and some kind of brand new um, owner operators just getting started. Um, and we tried to kind of take that, um, take that list that we compiled and put it into a book and that became Crafted with Pride. So then we had 750 companies all uh, producing, you know, clothing, footwear, accessories, within the United States and uh, just about anything you can think of is, is covered in this book. So it's uh, many years of work and research and we're very excited to have it out there in the world. Willie, anything to add on that background from your perspective? I think uh, really well said um, in terms of the actual book itself. I think the vintage background definitely uh, thread came through where we've got this uh, kind of introductory sections a little more in depth but the whole back section uh we refer to as like the yellow pages of made in usa so um definitely a bit of a, a throwback visually in terms of how things feel um yeah so, so who was this company I'm, I'm sorry who was this book designed to help was it designed to help companies contact each other network to begin networking together was it designed to help consumers choose us made products what's what, what what's that who's the target audience what well, i think hopefully all of the above but i think if you were to really go back to where it started um like alex said we were just having these conversations like who makes this stuff still hey have you heard of this company have you heard of that um so ultimately it was like something that we just wanted the two of us like this doesn't exist it'd be so amazing if it did and for a while it it was just the two of us we had a spreadsheet uh, like a Google Sheets that we would just drop brands into and share stories. And then very quickly, it was like, okay, I think there's all sorts of people could help consumers 100%. I'd say it's definitely consumer facing for the most part, um, just because that's where we're coming at it from. Um, but yeah, even in doing the research and talking with brands, we've definitely made some introductions um, between companies, which is really nice. So yeah. Were, were these were these companies... Any of these companies or many of these companies difficult to find? Uh, was it was it you know was it did you have to do a lot of digging to get to these companies? Which kind of speaks to the whole issue of of made in USA apparel. I, I would say definitely. I'll let Alex add on a little bit about the the hardcore digging because he's the definitely the the bookworm. Um, but I would just say a lot of our favorite finds um, were things I don't I don't think I'd ever be able to dig up. It's just like pure kind of serendipity. Um, like I'm wearing this vest, uh, from a company called Outlast Uniform, which is a one man operation in Chelsea, Mass. That makes really incredible, uh, workwear, cold, uh, storage outerwear. Um, and the way that I found it was a roommate of mine worked in food service and came home and would always talk about, uh, the jackets that their produce delivery guys wore. And then one day he found one of the jackets in the first store. I saw the label. Outlast Uniform, I called up the owner, Nick. We became pals. Uh, and yeah, so I think a lot of our favorite finds came like that. But for sure, to get to 100, 750, um, lots of digging. Alex can probably add on a bit there. A Alex, talk a little bit about that digging process, please. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it's a kind of use every resource you have. And uh, you know, we were doing a lot of online digging. Um, some websites much better than others. I mean, these companies, uh, you know, that have been around for a hundred years, sometimes they have excellent websites and sometimes, uh, you know, the website was made 20 years ago and it's uh, barely hanging on. And, um, you know, beyond that, it was a lot of word of mouth talking to other companies that we we're aware of. They said, oh, you should talk to our friends and, um, you know, whatever company. And, it was just, uh, it's a big snowball. I mean, we, we started with 250 companies and we thought we had all of them. And this was uh, maybe two years ago. And then 
uh, from that point forward, we started finding more and next thing you know, we're at 750. So um, a lot, a lot of looking around in, in every, you know, particular way we could come up with. Uh, it was just uh, really interesting to, to see how these companies come out of the woodwork. And, and just since we've released the book, we've found over 200 more companies. So um, it's just amazing that how quickly they they can pop out when you're uh, when you're not even looking. So this seems like it would have been a natural resource over the last ten years. It's it's surprising to me, uh, being a big supporter, a strong supporter of U.S. manufacturing, that something like this didn't already exist. And it, it, it I, don't you think it says something about about what our current situation is in terms of folks being able to buy, find and buy U.S. made products? Yeah, I, I think definitely. Um, I would add to like, I always kind of bring up the anecdote of this, a, a version of what we made did exist, has existed in the last 10 years, but a few additions, all in Japanese from Japan. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, the, in Japan is a really big, um, you know, interest in, made in USA and, and vintage American heritage clothing. And um, they've kind of carried the torch, I think, since the industry uh, started to decline in like the 80s and 90s. And um, that's been a really helpful resource, just kind of an interesting aside. Are you aware of any any actual collaboration that's taken place between any of these companies? In other, in other words, perhaps sourcing accessories from, from one another or, or parts from one another. Have you heard anything along those lines? Um, yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's just, uh, I mean, I don't have a particular example off the top of my head, but, you know, since we put this book out, we talked to plenty of companies that are either friendly and, you know, like share fabric. I, I guess one small example I have is I talked to a company in Portland that makes jackets. Um, and he says that they work with another company that also makes jackets, but a different style and they buy fabric together. And, you know, well, if they have too much work, sometimes they'll, you know, use each other's sewers and um, it's, you know, a very collaborative relationship. And beyond that, there's absolutely um, a lot of collaborations, you know, uh, brands that make different things working together. Um, and and I, we love to see that. And that's definitely one of the things that we were hoping would happen when we put this book together, because so many of these companies, um, you know, in this kind of more dire situation that we're in, really need to band together to be successful and um, kind of reach bigger customer bases that um, they're out there. They It's just kind of all these companies are in their little pockets and, um, to kind of put the pieces together is is absolutely critical for their future success. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Willie. I was just going to add on, I, I think one little thing in addition to uh, collaborating in terms of manufacturing, I feel like there is a, a nice um, amount of collaboration in terms of marketing to that LC, um, especially on like social media or online. Um, a lot of these brands working together that have a similar customer base um, where it just is like a natural fit. So like Vermont glove, uh, makes really great leather gloves. Uh, I know like Hartford denim company sells their gloves, you know, it's a complimentary, um, kind of way to, to work together. Wonderful. Uh, Claudia, you, uh, you grew up in California. You came to Rhode Island to go to RISD and you decided to establish a textile manufacturing company here in Rhode Island. Can you can you can you yeah. explain how that how that all came about? Yeah, that was not my plan when I went to graduate <laughs> school. Uh, certainly was not uh, top of mind. Uh, I graduated uh, from RISD in graphic design uh, with my master's in graphics, but I felt that uh, I really wasn't there wasn't very much gratification from producing a lot of graphics. So I really wanted to make a choice about making something more tangible. And uh, I started making, uh, you know, some decisions about what I wanted to do. And I'd always loved textiles. My great grandmother was a, a seamstress in Canada. 
She had made some really beautiful aprons for my mother. Uh, my grandmother had crocheted Afghans, um, you know, when I was growing up. So I really loved that idea of having something uh, made by hand. And I, I started making a few prototypes and um, kind of stumbled upon something that I just really loved uh, with linen and started making them on nights and weekends. And then it just started evolving. I started getting a little bit more interest and um, started planning to attend some of these craft shows uh, to get some feedback and um, you know, ended up getting some really good feedback. And um, I started getting more inspired and, and more, uh, you know, interested in getting something uh, made that, that was made in the United States. I'd always loved uh, something that was handmade, looking at something that wasn't mass produced. And uh, I, I just really think that, that that kind of handmade look has a certain personality and has a certain charm that you don't really see in mass produced items. Uh, it, it, they don't have as much soul as something that somebody touches by hand. Claudia, what were the biggest challenges uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, an operational standpoint that you've encountered? Well, it's, it's that I order such small quantities. So my supplier is in New York and, you know, to get a whole bolt of fabric is, you know, over, you know, uh, you know, my budget for ordering, you know, these and making these small batches. So um, that's, that's one of the, uh, the obstacles that I face is that I have to order these small quantities. And so my margin isn't as large as I would like it to be because of that small quantity order. And I've had to do a lot of research on where to find uh, different, uh, you know, different components that make these quilts. So where to buy thread wholesale and where to buy, uh, you know, some of the finishing pieces wholesale. Those are uh, all something that have been really, really challenging. So, so if you were if you were able to ramp up your sales, you'd be able to actually sell products at a lower price point because of that. Yeah, I would be able to uh, make, um, you know, I'd be, be able to order the, the supplies at a lower cost. So that would increase my margin. So I could have that on hand. I wouldn't have to pay for so much shipping. And that would, that would really, uh, my bottom line would be, uh, you know, improve my bottom line. How about your biggest problem from a production standpoint? Uh, finding uh, labor to help. So uh, I can't do this all myself. And as a small business owner, many people know we wear different hats. I, you know, I have to schedule photography. I have to do the marketing. I have to do the production. And as I'm scaling, I'm finding I really do need the help. And um, it, it's, I'm not really reinventing the wheel, but there is a certain learning curve involved in you know, the products that I have developed. So I really have had to um, be very careful about uh, talking to people about uh, their skill level matching to what my expectations are in terms of producing a product. And I've had some fails and uh, a few successes. And uh, I think that that just keeps me interested in seeing how I can really make that work. I, I really do believe that there is a labor market here in Rhode Island that would be ready to take some of these projects on. And, and is your distribution primarily uh, online or is it direct to consumer online or do you also uh, sell through uh, smaller gift shops or, or big box retailers? Um, it's usually just a straight, uh, you know, uh, uh, either uh, business to consumer or business to business. So I do do a lot of work with interior designers to do some custom work. And um, that's, that's, that's the bulk of my business. And then I have that online shop that um, where I sell it, you know, the whole, the whole line on, on, online. And how, how can you give, give us a sense of uh, the, the, the price point, your price points, you know, compared to the imports, I mean, I, I'm sure based on, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, there's quite a difference. Um, you know, since they're handmade products and there's a lot of um, labor involved in these handmade small batches. So my price point starts at about $500 to $600 for a throw. And then it ex exponentially goes up the larger the pieces and the more work is involved. And um, that's, that's the appeal, you know, that is the market that I'm looking to fill is those customers that are looking for the one of a kind piece of um, textiles that they won't find in the big box stores. And very recently, somebody asked me, well, what's going to happen if you have to scale up and, you know, produce for somebody like uh, Bed Bath & Beyond or Pottery Barn? And that's just not my customer. My customer is looking for the unusual, the small batch. So uh, something that is not done on a, a large manufacturing scale. Um, that's the appeal that we're sustainable and that we're looking to keep that local economy really going. Were there challenges that you, challenges that you confronted that you just didn't even expect? Like something that came at you out of the field or, or were you pretty much prepared? Um, for what you thought I think, um, yeah, um, I think uh, people are surprised by the jump in price from a throw to a custom like queen or king size because it almost doubles the price. Um, so that is something that um, I think I find people are still a little bit surprised about that, that big jump. And some people just don't bat an eye. So that kind of difference in customer is sometimes a little bit surprising to me still. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Carl, uh, can you tell us about, um, I wanna talk now a little bit about the issue of uh, sustainability mm -hmm. and, and how that relates to textiles. Clearly a product like Claudia's high quality product is going to last a long time. Mm -hmm. And there's so many products out there, you know, very cheap imports that are going to last, you know, a year maybe. So uh, certainly Claudia's business model in terms of production is more sustainable than what you typically buy in a big, big box retailer. So can you talk a little bit about how in, in your classes or your classrooms for TMD, um, that type of issue is addressed, the issue of sustainability and how it, how it is then applied to the real world? Yes, and it's, it's it's a good time to ask that question because there's there's been a lot of big increase in in interest in that, uh, not just in the TMD department but across campus, in in the issue of sustainability and environmental concerns, and um, we in the department we start right at the freshman level in our 103G class uh, with a sustainability discussion. And uh, the um, faculty member in charge of that class, actually, Dr. Goswami, is uh, heavily involved in the sustainability minor on campus. So it's it's more than again again more than just our department. But um, I do want to veer over just a little bit uh, to uh, to uh, something that both uh, Willie and Claudia made me think of, which is that um, I'm currently teaching a class. Uh, you mentioned the space travel stuff, Michael. I'm currently teaching a class in the honors program called From Mars to South County, where the um, space travel, uh, textile issues, circular economy issues of long duration space exploration uh, are essentially being used as inspiration for solving it for a discrete local community on Earth, which is basically the Narragansett Bay water, watershed. And uh, the group of students in there, um, there's one out of 19 as a textile student, uh, the rest is anthropology, journalism, animal science, film, biotech. Um, there's chemical engineering. There's health studies. There's wildlife conservation, kinesiology, biological sciences, psychology, pharmacy, more, and uh, uh, let's see, what else? Cell and molecular biology. And I'm mentioning that uh, to point out that each and every one of these students has found a place in their specialty to become excited about sustainable textiles. And they've been able to form projects that we're going to present. And uh, I would point that out to our audience uh, that one of the strengths of the TMD department, and then by projection into the URI community, 
is that we have all that to offer in terms of addressing these new challenges that sustainability is bringing to us, whether it's in the uh, manufacturing side, the marketing side, the chemical side, uh, whether we're dealing with biomimicry, uh, whether we're dealing with the uh, human behavior side, it's all there. And so, um, but anyway, to come come back to your come back to your question, um, we've been we've been pushing this, and the sustainability side is is getting very heavy. Um, my understanding is that the honors program is going to devote themselves to uh, sustainability issues now for the next three to five years, uh, possibly up to eight years. And, and you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Finish. I'm sorry. Well, and no, I'm just, and, and there's there's another fortunate aspect about our, our department so that I, I bring us back to Quinn Hall into, into TMD is that um, I think it was Willie who mentioned, you know, back in the 80s when when the outsourcing really picked up and and, and the business of, of textiles and fashion in the United States became a business and, and design. A lot of programs uh, abandoned the manufacturing side and, and went more over to a business side. Uh, we were somewhat fortunate, I suppose, at, at URI that um, we developed a marketing side, a textile marketing major, but we hung on to the other part too. And so we still have instruction in manufacturing, in draping, in pattern making, in CAD. Um, and so there's, there's still a large manufacturing component uh, to the education we can provide. And uh, you might have said back in the 90s that we were crazy to hang on to it, but now it looks like history as it does has become full circle and we find ourselves on the right side of the line again. So a question for Claudia and for Carl. Uh, commercialization. Clearly, it, it's something that, that Claudia, you're confronting because of the difference in the price points. It, it's not an easy thing uh, to commercialize um, a, a product that is... That is uh, more expensive product. So I'm, I'm curious as to Claudia in your in your experience at, at when you were at RISD, did you did you encounter any uh, any classes that that helped you with that or in Carl is is anything like that happening at URI? So I'll start with Claudia. That is a really good question. You know, when I was at RISD, uh, sustainability wasn't as much of a buzzword as it is right now. Um, it was something that we all considered. Um, I think the, the price differential is about quality. So I think that that um, is at the forefront, even if you're building a website design or if you're making a piece of artwork, it's about the, um, the thought, uh, the mindfulness, the uh, design that goes into it. And not only uh, just a, a simple design, but a well thought out design, something that has been um, uh, vetted or uh, looked at in different angles, uh, you know, peer reviewed and um, critiqued. And I think that is the difference in uh, making a, a product that is uh, beyond just kind of the status quo. Okay, Carl, what's what's happening on campus now? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, apart from what I just mentioned, uh, I could I could say that we have um, we have a rising awareness among the students uh, to to add to what what Claudia is saying that of course we are we are teaching design, we're teaching them to use social media, we're teaching them to use uh, the various skill sets necessary. But there's also pressure from the students themselves. There's also a rising awareness from them on the need for this. And so uh, you find an increase in the classroom discussions themselves on, you know, what are we doing to uh, address these concerns? How are we going to move forward? The students are sometimes a little bit um, more aggressive and more long-term thinking than, than you'd, you'd, you'd expect. But at the same time, um, we're trying very hard to, uh, as I said, push sustainability in, in all the courses we're teaching. And uh, we're lucky to see the uh, new honors director uh, bring this into a, into a much bigger, uh, bigger framing. And uh, Mary Parlange, the wife of our president, has been very good about uh, 
creating discussions and, and hosting small events to discuss sustainability issues uh, beyond even textiles. So uh, the campus itself is, is, is a good place, not just TMD in terms of these discussions. Uh, um, I have a couple, I want to follow up on that question, but uh, first, Aaron, do we have any questions from the group, from the crowd? None so far. So please don't okay. be shy. Use that chat in the feature, or you could even, if you want to get really wacky, we love wacky, uh, use the reactions thing to do a little raise of your digital hand, and, and we'd love to call on you and put you on the spot. Thank you, Aaron. You know, and I'm going to, I have some questions now for, for the panelists, uh, for all the panelists. 52% of consumers say they prefer to buy US made. My question to you is, will they walk the walk? Are they willing to pay a premium? And if so, how much? I'll just throw it out to the group. Um, I, think, I think we're going to say, I, I would say yes, but not just yet. It's, uh, was it St. Francis who prayed? Dear God, make me virtuous, but not yet. <laughs> um, I can't remember, but it's something like, it's something in that sense. I think what I'm getting, and especially from the discussions I'm getting uh, in, in the classes where sustainability is happening, that there is a, a willingness, but there's also a, a sense of not quite knowing what to do. And uh, to make it quick, I'll point out that, that a lot of the students in that honors class that I touted earlier are saying what we really need to do first is raise awareness before we do anything else. And we have to teach, and we need not just to raise awareness among consumers, we have to go into the K through 12 system and start affecting an actual cultural change on the kind of consumerism we've been used to up till now. Yeah, and I, would, I, I would add to that that, um, you know, we're all learning about sustainability and Matilda's a company is learning along the way. Uh, we don't, uh, you know, regard ourselves as experts on itch issues of sustainability, but we're learning and we're doing the best we can. And we're trying to get to understand how we can improve that whole system. And I do think that there are some people that are really willing to, to, to pay a premium for something that is sustainable and made in the United States. Because when I go to these, these shows, like one in particular in upstate New York, um, there's a host of other artists that are all making their living by making local and looking to uh, have things made here in the United States. And um, they're, they're really passionate about what they do. And I think they are looking forward to seeing, okay, how can we make this work? And I think it's gonna be the communication that, that happens within um, you know, these communities that really kind of help foster more growth, uh, much like um, you know, um, Willie and Alex had been talking about that other companies talk with other companies and they start sharing information. And I think that that's, that's when more change might happen. And Willie, Alex, any comments on that? Uh, I just a quick one to, to Carl's point about like A through 12 or younger folks. I, I kind of feel like that is maybe one area where I'd be a little optimistic that the opinions will, will shift like Gen Z, just thinking about even during COVID, um, just from personal experience, um, working at this vintage clothing warehouse, like the popularity of vintage clothing and vintage, I don't know, five, 10 years ago was like not a thing really that was big. It was very niche. Um, and now you see like apps like Depop and um, just social media, TikTok, like I, I think vintage clothing. And um, I know I hear a lot with Gen Z too, like reuse and upcycling and things like this um thrifting has become like a fad like i used to go to you know you go to savers and you like didn't really see anybody under the age of 20 usually now i go in and it's like all high school kids um so i don't know if that trend is going to stick necessarily but i think the idea of um the the notion of slow fast fashion and clothing consumption is definitely seems like it's on the mind more um with gen z than 
it was like, I'm, I would say I'm a millennial than when I was in high school or a younger person. Yeah, you know, I saw a question pop up on the screen that takes this question to the next level. So Erin, can you please read that question? Yeah, I was just going to say, what a perfect timing. Um, so Jenna asks, do you know what demographic of individuals are more likely to buy clothing made in the USA? And, you know, I love that question so much, and I'm, I'm going to even make it even a more of a, a more challenging question. And Carl, I, I raised this point at the recent sustainability summit that, that you folks hosted at URI. How are economically challenged families going to have the money to pay for sustainable products, sustainable garments, for example, that may cost three or four times more than what they currently buy? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so please consider that as, as you answer the question, that great question that was just asked by that audience member. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that is, that is a huge problem. And, and, and for those of you not familiar with the term, the price of poverty, uh, this is something we do discuss where, where because you can't afford the up, upper level item, you have to buy more of the lower price point items that don't last very long. And this is terrible in sustainable sustainability discussions. Uh, so um, what we do have to have to do there is we have to find ways to economically produce the products that are out there uh, rather than um, focus on perhaps high end or, or limited distribution uh, products. And this means moving the supply chain uh, back to the U.S. in a way that starts to cut out a lot of the extra costs that um, globalism wasn't supposed to bring to us, but has. So I think that's one of the challenges, but um, I'll let somebody else pick up too. But I do also want to talk about the, uh, the issues involved with manufacturing at home for uh, security reasons, but we'll get to that maybe later. Okay. Uh, anyone else yeah. want to chime in on that demographic yeah, no, question? I, I think it's interesting. If you look back in time, um, you know, there was a much wider array uh, array of uh, price points available for made in usa clothing um you know let's just say mid-century mid-20th century uh you know basically everyone was buying made in usa and that was the rich buying designer clothing and uh the working class buying well-made um you know work garments or everyday fashion um and i think to bring that supply chain back to kind of rebuild that network of uh, manufacturing and supplying, uh, that is the first step in order to kind of uh, make this whole again and make it affordable to everyone. Because obviously, you know, it's great that we make uh, amazing Made in USA uh, products, but yes, we want them to be available for everyone. Um, and that's that's a great thing to shoot for, a great goal to shoot for, so. And, and in terms of distribution, it strikes me that, that sustainable clothing runs against the grain of the business model of big, big box retailers who want to sell you stuff and then quickly sell you something else and sell you something else again. So it, it, this is a, a full supply chain issue, I think. Yeah, I, th I think it's a mentality uh, issue too. It's uh, what frame of mind you're willing to put into what you buy and what you put in, you know, what you take into your life. Um, and, you know, we had talked too about nearshoring as an option uh, of not, uh, you know, uh, sending those labor jobs overseas, but actually maybe looking at other sources that we could use to bring those price points down that um, might help with, with the, the demand of those lower priced items, you know, maybe out of Mexico, maybe out of Canada or somewhere where it's local uh, to this continent and we don't have to wait for that long, that uh, long time frame of ordering something. Um, that is just another way of thinking about this, uh, this, this production issue. You know, I, I want to talk briefly just and bring up this point, and we, we'll come back to this, to, to the whole consumer issue, because this factors into it as well. The role of government. Um, I happen to be reading, uh, 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 it's a 
report from the uh, Journal of the Rhode Island Historical Society recently, their fall issue. And there was a great article in there about the textile business here in Rhode Island. And so if you look at the ramp up of textiles here in Rhode Island, we were the center of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. How did that happen? So Samuel Slater opens up his powered cotton mill, the first one in the New World of Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 1790. 20 years later, 1810, there are 26 textile mills in Rhode Island. So roughly one a year opening up. That from between 1810 and 1815, another 146 opened up. So what happened between 1810 and 1850 to make the number of textile mills go from 26 to 169? What happened were the, the wars between Britain and France and the US to protect US shipping uh, uh, adopted a non-importation act, which uh, forbade companies to import products from either England or France to keep US ships safe. So all those textiles, all those fabrics that were traditionally coming from England, suddenly they were cut off. And that's one of the, that, that is the, one of the major reasons that we became a major textile producer here in Rhode Island. So government action was very important to that ramp up. So I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to know, again, I'm gonna throw this out to the group. What's the role of government today? Well, I, I would point to two things um, that, that uh, cultural change uh, usually happens without government supervision. <laughs> Uh, but secondly, um, we have lost the ability to look to government for assistance, I believe. I think that is not something that is built in to our current system. And I, I worry that this, will, this decision will be taken out of our hands uh, by events. I mean, we've, we've seen in the last five years these two totally unexpected things happen that have totally changed how we're viewing global uh, futures right now. We had a th the three-year pandemic, which of course isn't quite over just yet. And then, uh, gee, Russia invades Ukraine. And uh, in the middle of that, suddenly we are now starting to see China being redefined as, as, a, uh, as a Cold War type, possibly even hot war type enemy. And um, so suddenly the next 20 years look very different than we thought five years ago. Mm. Willie, Alex, any thoughts on that? No, oh, you're muted, Alex. I think you're trying to say something, but you're muted. Any questions? Yeah, there? No, oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there. You know, another thing to consider is that you know during the 20th century, uh, you know, there was quite a few import restrictions, tariffs. Um, in place by the U.S. government, uh, which protected the economy and the uh, textile industry quite a bit. So not necessarily saying that that is the um, way to go, but, um, you know, certain restrictions or tariffs could help protect um, U.S. industry. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, other ways to go about, you know, promoting industry, promoting small business, entrepreneurship. Um, and I think we need to take a serious look at all of those things. But, um, it, you know, having textile manufacturing in the U.S. is a critical issue, um, key for national security, key for sustainability. And, you know, it really needs to be strongly considered, um, you know, to, that we should protect that industry and not let it be basically run over by uh, foreign competition. Mm -hmm. Carl? And Michael, you, we, we've talked about this before, but the, the idea of national security uh, is, is big in this sense. And, and, and the, the U.S. military is waking up to a rather bad situation right now where the manufacturing of textile products for military use uh, is not sustainable in the United States for United States military needs. And um, nothing seems to make governments move faster than military needs. So maybe we see something happening there uh, in the near future. But, but that is something to keep an eye on. And um, the Barry Amendment is a very important one to, to um, keep in mind. 
Yes, and, and uh, Senator Reid has been a strong supporter of the Berry Amendment, uh, mm -hmm. especially concerning textiles uh, in his role as uh, chair of the Senate Arm, uh, Armed Services Committee. Uh, Aaron, any other questions in the, in the chat box? No, we're having a lively discussion about the kind of idea of the demographics um, and going through there. Um, and so we've tried to share a couple of things and, and thank you, Mike, for also sharing um, some stats that you found. Um, and I just realized I still have my video up, so I'll go back on that. Uh, for prior to coming to Polaris MVP and helping to uh, communicate what we could do for manufacturers, we can do with manufacturers, what manufacturers can do for Rhode Island and the United States. I spent about 15 years marketing to seniors. And so the idea of demographics and how they influence your buying behavior as it goes to Made in USA is a very interesting thing that has kind of seen its its peaks and valleys over the years, you know. Not everybody thought Made in the USA was a good thing for a while because depending on where you you had your your kind of influences in your younger years. So it is very interesting to see now in some of the stats that we've been sharing that it seems to be creeping back up. So yeah, good discussion there. All right, good fantastic, discussion. fantastic. Uh, I, and I think I saw you uh, posting this, um, Aaron, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll have them tell us about it anyway. Uh, Willie and Alex, where can we buy your book? Uh, craftedwithpride.us is our web store. Okay, uh, and, and Matilda, uh, for Matilda, uh, Claudia? Yeah, uh, we just launched our new website. It's matildhome.com. And that's up and, up and running. And then we'll be at uh, a few local um, uh, fairs coming up. Uh, Providence uh, Hope Street Fair coming up May 20th. And that'll be in Providence. All right. And, and Carl, we all know where to find you. <laughs> You all know where to find me, and I hope you do find me, and I hope you do get in touch if there's anything I can do. I want to, I want to, I want to thank uh, thank all of our panelists today. You've uh, you've been wonderful and very helpful, and shared a lot of great information. I want to thank our partners, Polaris MEP and URI. So uh, I'd ask you though, please stay tuned for future webinars like these. And uh, by the way, if you are a Rhode Island-based Island textile company out there and you have any interest in hosting an in-person networking meeting to bring together uh, Rhode Island's textile companies, please <laughs> let me know. We can, always, we can always bring in a couple of speakers and make a nice morning out of it. So um, we're, we're, if, if you're interested in that, please let us know. Again, thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you to our panelists and hope to see you soon. Thank thanks you. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.